recording. Um, so this is what Dr. Fortner is going to go over. This is his PowerPoint. Um, and then I just wanted to say a few things. Next week we have quit, uh, exam number two. I did create a study guide for exam number two for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. Um, I kind of just broke it up into these are the sections that are going to be on exam number two, cardiology, GI, um, respiratory, antibiotics, antifungal, and then prescription writing. Um, and then these are just some, some things for you to really zone in on. So now if you take this study guide and you compare it with the study guides that you guys write, you hand in every week, um, and then the PowerPoints, that should be what you really need to focus on for studying. Additional things that were, will be very helpful is if you um, pull up any Quizlets that have been created, um, those will be very helpful. Um, and especially if you notice that those Quizlets are overlapping material that we're or focusing on in class. Um, but these, so for example, so, um, you know, like the mechanism of action of a beta blocker. So what's the main thing that's happening when somebody takes a beta blocker? So just make sure you understand that, um, you know, the suffixes for the different um, hypertensive medications or the different heart disease medications. What, it, what is typically an allol or a pril or a prine or a pine? So those things, that's, that stuff's gonna be on the quiz. So there's not, or on the exam, there's not, there's maybe two questions that are very specific, name this drug kind of thing, kind of question. Most of them are going to be side effects, mechanism of action, um, you know, receptor things like what's happening with the receptors. Not a lot of them are going to be like, name a drug that does this. You know, there's not a lot of that. There are, there's like two or three where you're going to have to like, you know, or it might say of these drugs, which one is a diuretic or of these drugs, which one is, um, you know, what causes, what's a first generation antihistamine or something. Oh, sorry make that go quiet. So you need to be familiar with like broad categories, basically. So when you look at, you know, drugs, you want to kind of know what they fit into in a very kind of broad way. And then oral manifestations is huge. You always want to know if there's something that's causing gingival, um, gingival enlargement or um, hyperplasia, or if something is creating ulcers or, you know, um, excessive dry mouth or something like that. Those are orthostatic hypotension, something that's very specifically related to practice, what you guys will see. So anything that's an oral side effect is a big deal. If it's just some kind of obscure thing that, you know, that's not so important. But then again, also, like if it's a very heavily sedating drug, like Benadryl, first generation antihistamine Benadryl, there makes people sleepy. They take it to go to sleep. So that's something you should know. Whereas like Claritin or Zyrtec, that not so much, you know, so kind of these broader subjects, but so I hope that will kind of help you guys um, kind of know what to focus on because I know there's a lot of information. Um, so there's, so I put that in there. Can't figure out how to get out of here now. Um, so that's at the top, the study guide. And then the other thing too is these Quizlets. So I think I already said that. So those are just kind of adjunct. Those will help you. If you study the PowerPoint, you review the, the things that are kind of guiding you on the study guides and then that study guide for the exam. Um, those three things should get you prepared for the exam quite well. But if a concept is still like, if you can't explain a concept, to somebody, to your, one of your classmates, then just go back to the textbook and fill in the missing pieces or run through some of these Quizlets and see if the Quizlets help you kind of fill in the missing pieces. Because sometimes someone will put a question in a different way that's like, oh, okay, I, you know, I kind of think about it differently. So we just have about 20 more minutes before I wanted to give you guys a quick break before, um, Dr. Fortner comes. So what I'm going to do now, instead of lecturing, I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to break out into groups. And um, there's, I have seven questions. So I'm going to make seven um, breakout groups. Make sure there's nothing in the chat that I'm missing. 
I have a question. So yeah, you're saying okay. there is fill in the blank for the next test? There are no fill in the blank. It's all multiple choice. I know. Yay. I know. Okay. Um, Leslie, I have a question. Yes. Um, is there time that we can go over a few questions on the study notes? Yes. Yeah, so let's see. So let me look here real quick. Let me just look at one thing on my, probably sharing my calendar of events. Hmm. So on Friday, I will, so I teach lab on Friday, but during the lunch hour, I have oral med office hours. So if anybody has, so it'll probably be from like 1215 to um, like 1215 to 1255. So there'll be probably a good 40 minutes um, of a Zoom call. Um, so if anybody wants to pop in there and the way you get to that um, link is you go to um, you go to the Google Doc that says, here, let me stop sharing and then come back in. And you'll be at school, right? I'm going to be at school on Friday because I'm in, in the um, lab with the seniors, but I'll come in um, on my lunch and I'll be in the virtual Zoom. I'll just open up Zoom while I eat. So if anybody has any last minute exam questions, that would be a good time. If you've studied and you're just like, nah, I'm still confused on this question, that would be a good time to address it. So okay. that's Friday from like 1215. And I'll resend out that link for, for you guys, just in case you need a reminder of that. Okay. So I'm going to share this. Actually, no, I'm going to put this link in the chat. This is the Google Doc here. I'm gonna put this in the chat. So everyone go to this Google Doc, and then I'm going to randomly put you into groups, and you'll have about 15 minutes to um, answer these and save this document because these questions will help you also um, for um, study for the exam. So everyone has different questions, so that'll help you kind of um, prepare some of these topics. So I'm going to randomly assign you. So just pay attention to which breakout room you're in and court and match it with the group question. And then I'll bring you all back in about um, just before, like about at 140, and then we'll take a break. McKenna, McKenna, you can stop in my office on um, on Friday, but I'll still have the Zoom up to help other, you know, everyone, anyone else that wants yeah. to be on the Zoom, but you certainly can come in in person. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Did you get assigned to a room? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I want you guys to be able to review it. Okay, so 
hopefully everyone's back or is getting back. Um, and I see um, Dr. Fortner up there in the corner. So today we have Dr. Fortner from pharmacy to talk about um, GI uh, medications and some mechanisms of actions with those medications. I don't have like a little thing to, do you want to um, give your, a little background for yourself, Dr. Fortner? Cause I don't have anything. Sure. I know you're That's in right. pharmacy and you talk about- I'm in topic. pharmacy. That's it. <laughs> That's all you need to know. I'm a pharmacist. No. Okay. You've <laughs> no. been, I've, wait, how I've been, you been uh, you've been with the school for like 13 years now. Prior to that, I worked at Fred Meyer as your one of your friendly neighborhood pharmacists. And uh, before that, I went to like Oregon State at the pharmacy program. It was before there was a pharmacy program in at Pacific, which mm -hmm. started in 2006 and I graduated in 04. So um, yeah, I practiced at a little independent pharmacy to keep, keep skills up and that kind of stuff. And Cool. Well, welcome. Thanks for um, talking to us and um, sharing your knowledge with us. So I'm going to mute myself and let you roll with it. Do, can you right. share? Do you have control to share or do you need me to make you co-host? Uh, let's let's see if this works. Looks like it's working. We're good. Go. So, yeah, today we're going to be talking about um, GI drugs. Sorry, my kid is here with asking me questions. Okay, yeah, everybody was showing their dogs earlier, but uh, my dog's getting a haircut right now, so I couldn't partake in that, but I can show you my kid. Um, all right, so we've got, uh, we're going to be talking about GI drugs today, so I'm going to kind of be talking about uh, common medications uh, used to uh, treat GI conditions. We're going to talk about some of the therapeutic uses and, and benefits of, uh, of GI drugs and kind of how they work in a basic mechanism of action stuff. And then we'll talk about side effects uh, with emphasis on, on dental implications and things like that. Considerations for when you've got folks in the chair with you. Uh, at any point during this, please feel free to either unmute to get my attention or type something in the chat. I will open a chat window down here and kind of keep an eye on that. Um, I'd rather you ask the question kind of if in the moment rather than wait till I've got a few program stops to check for questions, but I'd rather you just ask it while it's fresh in your mind so you don't have to worry about forgetting it later or not hear something else because you're thinking about a question. So um, let's see, I guess um, the, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to tell you before I got started, not really. I teach mainly in the first year of our pharmacy program, kind of in our pharmacy practice type courses where we talk about common drugs, top 200 drugs and uh, self-care products and things like that. Um, so anyway, happy to answer any questions you guys might have as they come along. So uh, what we've got today, we're going to start out uh, talking about peptic ulcer disease or PUD, and then we're going to talk about GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease, and we'll talk constipation and diarrhea. So we'll end on a high note here. Uh, talking about this human tube uh, that we are, we're just one big long tube for absorbing food and nutrients, and there's Lots of things that can break bad in this tube. So we're gonna talk about some of that today. Not going into super detail because we got an hour, but we'll make the most of what we've got. Uh, so peptic ulcer disease, what are some potential causes of PUD? Anybody, can anybody think of anything that, that you've heard and cause ulcers either anecdotally or in other classes that you've had? H. pylori. Excellent, Charles. That is definitely one of the culprits that we will talk about a little bit today. Any other any other things that kind of contribute to ulcers that y'all have heard of? Stress, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> smoking, yeah, smoking can uh, increase risk of uh, of ulcers. You guys are on top of this. You don't really need me here. I'm just for show, and that's fine by me. Uh, medications, yes, exactly, Avon. There are a lot of medications that can contribute. Uh, so ulcers as well. Um, symptoms of them uh, include, you know, pain in the stomach area. Basically, the weird thing with ulcers is they can kind of get better and worse, sort of randomly and sporadically over time, uh, and can have really long periods of, you know, nothing much going on in between uh, getting an ulcer. Uh, but when it gets really bad, uh, you can get vomiting. Uh, you can even be vomiting blood, which is not great. Uh, and as you can see in these little images here, you know, an ulcer is, is basically an open sore uh, along the stomach or intestines or somewhere that it shouldn't be. 
Um, peptic ulcers, you know, happen primarily in the stomach here. And if they get really bad, they can puncture the lining of this uh, stomach and then you're dumping stomach contents into your abdomen, which you really don't want stomach contents in your abdomen. Stomach contents are very acidic and that can cause a whole lot of um, issues with infection and damage to surrounding organs and things like that really quickly. So uh, there are just as kind of a refresher, um, you know, symptoms are, the, you all know what symptoms are. They're signs and things that, that are happening when, when you know, there's a disease state of some kind. The complications are kind of like the really bad symptoms or the things we hope to avoid by treating um, a condition. So complications would be the bleeding that we talked about, perforation, which is an ulcer eating its way all the way through the stomach lining and perforating, or something called pyloric stenosis is another um, complication that can happen where you get uh, the, the, these like openings uh, at the either end of the stomach can get um, scar tissue around them if the ulcer happens near there and, and you can get food blockage and, and things like that. So not great. Um, just as there, you probably have heard of black tarry stools before as a sign of, uh, of blood in the, uh, in this, in the intestines. Uh, anybody know why it's black? Or tarry? <laughs> Blood, blood. Yeah, exactly. The, any idea what what, in, what is happening? It, it is a symptom of or a so, so sign that there is blood kind of higher up. Yeah, oxidation, right? So it's like you think of what's in our blood cells. It's a bunch of iron molecules, the, the heme molecules that are that are uh, carrying the oxygen. Well, that iron basically, when it when the when it gets in the intestines, it's, uh, it gets uh, oxidized and and essentially rusts. So you're basically pooping rust when you have lactary stools. Um, and uh, that's an indication that the blood or the bleeding is happening higher up in the intestinal tract. So if we back up to our little picture here, if you're getting bleeding up in the stomach or small intestine, kind of earlier in the small intestine, by the time it gets through the small intestine and out the colon, um, that's the, out the business end of the colon there, that's, uh, it's, it's black and tarry. If you've got bright red blood, that's an indication of bleeding somewhere closer to the anus, like usually in the, towards the end of the small intestine. So things like um, hemorrhoids or you know, bleeding polyps or other kind of issues and things like that. So uh, it just hasn't had time to oxidize because it hasn't made its way through the... Uh... <laughs> Charles took a GI class in college. That's right. Uh, <laughs> he is the, you know, uh, in Avalon, you're going to be the GI, GI person now too. So let's go ahead back here, what we were talking about, all this bad stuff. So let's watch a quick little video. This is things only like a minute and a half. Kind of talks about um, how the stomach works here and hopefully the sound comes through. Let's see how it works. The stomach plays a key role in digestion, breaking down food by producing a strong acid. Protecting itself from the harsh effects of this acid, the stomach maintains an unstirred mucus layer that protects the stomach lining. The balance between the protective mucus layer and the strong acid, along with other factors, helps to keep your stomach healthy. The mucus layer is produced within the stomach lining mainly by small cells called goblet cells. Stomach acid is produced by parietal cells and released into the stomach by many tiny acid pumps that are parts of these cells. Certain pain medications such as ibuprofen, naproxen, and aspirin travel through the body in blood vessels. When these medicines, called NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, are released in the stomach lining, they cause the goblet cells to decrease production of mucus. Reduction of mucus may cause the protective barrier to become thin, allowing the strong stomach acid to come into direct contact with, and in some cases cause damage to, the stomach lining. This damage can sometimes lead to an ulcer. Some ulcers can lead to serious medical problems, like bleeding and stomach blockage. If you're taking certain pain medications, such as ibuprofen, naproxen, or aspirin, on a continuous basis, talk to your doctor or healthcare professional okay. about information regarding maintaining a... Great. I, kind of, I guess it was supposed to stop there. It looked like it froze. But anyhow, uh, so that the, as Avalon mentioned, medications can cause um, ulcers and as they listed off a bunch of NSAID medications, which you I'm sure are aware come into 
contact with and, and uh, a lot for dental pain and things like that. Uh, so those kind of predispose folks to ulcers. So if they're on, if they're on them, you usually have to be on them for a decently long time. If they're on them for just a few days, it's not really going to be an issue. But um, uh, if you're on it for more than that, you know, you can, uh, you can thin that mucus layer, like the video said, uh, the irritation can happen. And if it doesn't have time to heal that as, as a, uh, just a reminder, the stomach is one of those areas of the body that's constantly making new cells at a pretty high rate of speed, uh, kind of like skin and things like that, where you're constantly regrowing um, tissue in the stomach lining uh, to offset any irritation or damage that can occur to it from eating or from medication and this kind of stuff. But if the damage is too severe to be offset by that healing process, that's when you get ulcer formations. And once one forms, it can it gets continually irritated by the stomach acid and it's really hard to, because um, when, it, when, it, when it's damaged, it's not getting that protective mucus layer on it. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. Uh, so medications for PUD, uh, this is when H. pylori comes in. Uh, H. pylori is a bacteria that's uh, found natively in, uh, in a lot of stomachs that have ulcer issues. Uh, it seems to be kind of like a uh, indicator or risk factor and, and H. pylori for whatever reason irritates the stomach more than someone without H. pylori and so that it can take advantage of any damage to help form an ulcer. So a lot of the treatments we do um, uh, revolve around eradicating that H. pylori and also giving an acid reducer to kind of slow the damage uh, to the stomach to allow it time to heal itself. So uh, there's this kind of cocktail of medications that we'll put people on if they've got ulcers just a week or two worth of meds and usually causes pretty quick uh, relief. Um, once you basically give the body a, uh, a chance to catch up with the damage and, and overcome it, things heal relatively quickly. So that's great. Um, let's see, you can also, sometimes we'll add bismuth subsalicylate, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, more. And anybody know what the, what's the, what's the brand name for bismuth subsalicylate? Pepto-bismol. There it is, Pepto-bismol. I don't know who said it, but you're right. The, uh, this is so hard teaching them on, online because if I was in person, I'd be like giving you guys candy uh, for asking questions and answering questions, but you're just gonna have to- Give yourself candy. Give yourself candy, thank you, honey. Um, so let's see, there's some bismuth subsalicylate, good old, uh, good old product for, you know, indicated for mild diarrhea and can also help with the H. pylori. Um, the salicylate kind of, they think it, as far as how it works, uh, Pepto works is the salicylate decreases secretions a little bit uh, and the bismuth uh, has some antimicrobial action, they think. You can also get this black tarry stool. Um, <laughs> second floor, that's right. I know right where the classroom is. I am, are you guys in, you know, nobody's in the classroom though. That's the problem. I'll have to bring you some later. Uh, so, as far as uh, that's that's how the bismuth is working. Big side effect is that black uh, black stool and tongue. This isn't this isn't uh, this is basically the bismuth itself oxidizing and kind of sticking to the tongue. It just wipes right off. You can rinse the mouth and it's fine, but it can be kind of concerning. And so it's harmless, but just scary looking. One thing you can get that's not so harmless is Rye syndrome or Ray syndrome, um, which is. Uh, you know, an odd syndrome you can get when folks have like a viral disease and they take some kind of an NSAID and it's primarily happens in kids and like teenagers and stuff and primarily young kids. But um, this is why we try not to give young kids NSAIDs when they're, when they have like a cold or sickness or something like that. We stick to things like Tylenol because they're safer. They don't cause this rise syndrome. Uh, all right. And as far as dental health considerations go, uh, you can, you know, ask uh, if you see that they're uh, check med history basically is going to give you a clue to a lot of what uh, might be going on as far as uh, GI issues in a patient. So if you're seeing things like they take Pepto or they're on, um, you know, that uh, that PrevPak thing we saw with all the antibiotics and, and, an, uh, and a proton pump inhibitor, like we'll talk about shortly, then ask them about, uh, you know, if they're under control, if, if they're, if it's uncontrolled, they might have vomiting, hopefully not coming in if they're if they're vomiting under control, but you never know. Uh, but uh, as you're going to see, most of the GI con uh, conditions can be assisted by using a semi-supine chair position uh, when you're working on them. Just keeping them a little more upright tends to lead to a lot more comfort for the patient and less issues. 
Questions on PUD before we change gears to GERD. All right. Yeah, Janice, you got you got earn these uh, these Twizzler mustaches. Asking questions or answering, just kidding. I get, I, I'd be nice to give you candy anyway. Uh, GERD is uh, an issue with the lower esophageal sphincter or less. Oh, well, good old less right here. Uh, basically, relaxes when it shouldn't and allows stomach contents to squeeze back up into the esophagus, irritating the esophagus, causing damage to the esophagus, and potentially causing ulcers and things like that. Uh, like we were just talking about, but it's basically, it's, it's refluxing back up. There are lots of um, the different uh, issues that can, that can cause this. You've got the you know, more common after meals because the stomach is full, so it's under pressure. You've got obesity, the uh, extra body tissue is pushing on the stomach, kind of squeezing it, causing more pressure. Um, you can, nicotine and smoking relaxes that lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, so that causes the issue to occur more. You can get hernias. There's all there's all kinds of reasons that can that can lead uh, to GERD, including things like stress and some of the other things we talked about for, for ulcers as well. Um, GERD, the symptoms, you know, tends to be, you know, a lot of people have probably had heartburn. That's basically kind of you can think of heartburn as sort of mild transient GERD. If you get heartburn a lot and it gets really bad, then you've got GERD. Um, so. Uh, if it gets really bad, you get a uh, reflux of stomach contents all the way up into the mouth, basically getting the acidic contents in the mouth. You can, get, you can get these dental erosions, and that would be, again, a complication. So that a really bad side effect or, or a, a symptom that we would hope to avoid by treating it before it got too bad. And so these uh, pictures here are, are of you know, the erosion caused by uh, excess stomach acid refluxing up into the mouth. Uh, you can relieve it with antacids. Antacids are kind of a short-term deal. You know, they they're, they're, they are what they sound sound like. They're basic, pro chemically basic products that um, that uh, basic that basically. Wah wah. That's my dad joke for the day. They they neutralize the acid on a chemical sense. You got an acid in the base mixing, pH normalizes, and and that's how they work. They work quick, but they don't work for very long. Um, so um, something, we'll, and we'll talk more about ways to treat these things in a little bit. Uh, but you can get all kinds of other issues. It can make it can mess with patient's asthma because you can get some uh, inhalation of stomach contents occasionally or irritation around the trachea and all that kind of stuff. And over time, potential for oral cancer. So all these things we'd hope to avoid. So how do we avoid them? We've got a variety of products to treat uh, the things we've just been talking about. Proton pump inhibitors are kind of the big guns. They're the really powerful stuff that you know, when I was going through pharmacy school, these were prescription products and not long towards the end of pharmacy school, they came out over the counter. Um, antacids, like we talked about, are the quick acting kind of inexpensive uh, first line of defense. And kind of in between, probably should have organized these differently top to bottom now that I think about it. Uh, H2 receptor ag antagonists are kind of uh, medium strength, medium duration of action, mid-range products. Uh, that you'll a lot of times see combined with, or in some cases see them combined with antacids for kind of a quick relief and then something that kicks in a little bit later. Um, and so we're going to talk about each of these in turn. Again, if you have questions, uh, just pop it in the chat or unmute. So, so first up, our friends, the pro proton pump inhibitors. So everybody's probably heard of Prilosec. Prevacid is another example. Nexium is... I think that one is still uh, prescription only. No, uh, Protonix, Asifex, Dexalant is prescription only. But if you look closely at these, uh, can't really see them on these boxes, but the active ingredient for Prilosec is Omeprazole. And the active ingredient for Nexium is S-Omeprazole, E-S-Omeprazole. So Prilosec was first developed and was a, was a prescription product. It went over the counter got off patent, and so a bunch of generics came out for it. Well, then the company that made it uh, then refined and used just the S enantiomer. Uh, if you guys remember back to chemistry class, you might remember that all chemical molecules have like a left-handed and a right-handed version. Uh, and usually in, when you're making a drug for like an active ingredient for a drug, uh, you just 
you take both both uh, left and hand, right hand versions of the molecules together. One of them usually is a little more effective than the other, but it's it's not worth the cost and time and expense to separate those two versions of the molecule out. So you just make the companies make them together, put them in the capsule, and that's their that's your Prilosec. Well, when the patent runs out and they want to make some more money, they go through that extra step. And in this case, they took the, the S or sinister or left-handed version of the molecule that makes up omeprazole and put that into a capsule. And then, hey, all of a sudden they got another patented product that they can charge a lot more money for. It's, the same, it's, it's pretty much the same effectiveness as Prilosec. It's the same thing. It's just a little bit more refined. Uh, same thing kind of happened with Dexalant. You've got Dexlanzoprazole. Dex meaning Dexter, in, which is Latin for right. Uh, S is sinister, Latin for right. So uh, this is the right-handed molecule or of lanzoprazole, which is what Prevacid is. So anyway, that was your nerdy uh, pharmacy geek moment. And I'm going to get back on topic now. Okay, proton pump inhibitors. These ones are the big guns because what they do is they irreversibly shut down that acid producing cell in the stomach lining. That one we watched in the video, those little green ones that were pumping out stomach acid, like pure hydrochloric acid, basically. Um, it shuts it, the, the molecules in these proton pump inhibitors. They basically bind to those pumps and they lock them up and they never fall off. Usually a lot, in a lot of the way, the way a lot of drugs work, I like to think of them as locks and keys. The drugs are the keys and your body cells have lots of locks on them that, and that basically turn on switches and turn off switches that make body processes stop or go, right? And most of the time, most drugs as a key will float around until they find a lock, they'll activate it or turn it off for a little while. And then eventually that key will fall out and then the lock or switch will go back to normal and just keep doing its thing. In the case of proton pump inhibitors and certain other drugs, it, that key gets so stuck to that lock, it never falls out. And the body has to make a new lock, which by in the stomach happens relatively quickly because again, that stomach lining sloughs off and, and gets digested and a new one comes up. Um, so, so it, you know, you have to keep taking the medicine, but it's really very effective at dropping the acidity level of the stomach really sub substantially. So you get um, a lot of relief for things like GERD and, and stuff like that. Um, really low side effects for these, which is nice. Uh, one that could particularly apply to dental hygiene is you get some xerostomia or taste perversion. So that it's very rare, but it, but it could happen. Uh, when you get into the antacids, these are just what they sound like. It's like calcium carbonate, Tums, it's, it's chalk, basically. Calcium carbonate is, is chalk. <laughs> so uh, you're eating chalk with some yummy flavor in it, and then that chalk goes and, and connects with the hydrochloric acid in the stomach and becomes neutralized, makes water, and that, that takes care of the stomach acid. Um, it, it works immediately, essentially on contact with the stomach contents. It starts, you know, and it's, if you got any reflux in the esophagus as the, as your chewed up rollades or tums are going down, they're neutralizing acid as they go. So you get like this really uh, pretty immediate relief, which is nice. Unfortunately, it also gets washed away pretty quickly and then it's gone. And then if you get more reflux, you're back to square one. So short, short acting, uh, a quick relief, but, but, but don't, it doesn't last very long. Diarrhea and constipation are the most common side effects of those. Whatever, however your, your body's kind of uh, physiology responds to it will dictate whether you get one or the other. I know they're kind of opposite ends of the spectrum, but everybody's a snowflake and, and not sure how each people will react until you try it. Um, the third big class is our H2 receptor antagonists, which are uh, histamine uh, type two antagonists. And so these guys, they are uh, also shutting off those acid pumps in the stomach, but these are the little drug keys that stay on for a little while and then fall off. So they're pretty effective. Uh, they take longer than antacids to work. They don't work as long as proton pump inhibitors, and they also don't work as strongly as proton pump inhibitors, but you know they're still pretty good. Um, and uh, as far as side effects, pretty well tolerated. You get in constipation, diarrhea, maybe some headache, dizziness. Um, this is a, just a little side view of what's a representation of one of those acid producing cells in the stomach lining, the parietal cells, and kind of showing you where different things work. So things like uh, proton pump inhibitors gum up the works of the actual pump that is spitting out hydrogen ions into the, uh, into, into the stomach 
uh, chloride ions sort of passively go through and then and they make hydrochloride or hydrochloric acid and it, off it goes into the stomach. Uh, this is, an, this is a, an ATPase pump and proton pump inhibitors are shutting down that pump so it doesn't work anymore. H2 receptor antagonists come along the backside of the cell or somewhere on the outside and turn off the pump. So rather than like grinding up the works of the pump irreversibly, they just go and flick the switch off for a little while. And then they get, I don't know, they get bored or distracted and they go do something else, fall off, and then the pump turns back on. Um, drugs, anticholinergics. Uh, have you guys covered anticholinergics in any other class? I think you have at this point in the curriculum, right? Anybody, uh, you guys ever learn the limerick for, or do, do you know what I mean by anticholinergics, I guess would be the first question. Yeah, we, we talked about that some in our, um, in the second week of our okay. um, autonomic nervous system and then some of the medications after that. Yes, thank you. So the anticholinergics uh, are kind of a class, a, a broad class of medications that, uh, that have effects throughout the body that are you know, pretty noticeable to patients. So one of them is, um, is messing with these uh, acid pumps as well, kind of can shut them down. The, so there, there's a limerick we learn in pharmacy to help us remember the side effects of anticholinergics. It's, uh, it's not entirely safe for work, but it's can't see because it makes your vision blurry, can't spit because it decreases uh, saliva production, uh, can't pee because it decreases urine production or kind of causes, potentially can cause like urinary retention and stuff. Um, and then can't shit because it makes you constipated. So can't see, can't spit, can't pee, can't shit. Those, that's, our, that's our little limerick for the major side effects of anticholinergics. Um, and we so have, they need to know, so that's a good one, but they need <laughs> to know um, SLUD, which was saliva, lacrimation, constipation, and your, I'm saying it wrong, urination and defecation or something. So there, that's yeah. what they're, that's in their study notes. And you need to know that for the exam, by the way, guys. So listen. Well, there you go. I just it, gave you a slightly you. naughty limerick to help yeah. you remember. Uh, Maybe that'll help them remember that. Yeah, so exactly. Connect that can't to the see. anticholinergic. <laughs> can't see. Yeah. My kids uh, especially love that one. All right. Um, one more quick video. This is our last one for the day, another minute or so, but it kind of sums up what we've been talking about and it's pretty. So let's watch. The inner surface of the stomach is formed into numerous gastric pits from which acid is secreted. The cells lining the gastric pits are mucous neck cells which secrete mucus, the G cells which secrete gastin, the parietal cells which secrete hydrochloric acid. The proton pump present in parietal cells is responsible for acid secretion. The proton pump is located in the luminal side of the parietal cell. Proton pump, proton, potassium, ATP. The proton pump actively transports protons into the stomach lumen and potassium back to the parietal cell with hydrolysis of ATP. Proton pump inhibitors are drugs which reduce acid secretion of the stomach. The drug binds irreversibly to the proton pump and prevents the active transport of protons. This dramatically decreases the acid secretion of the stomach. That's it. Proton pumps are amazing. The inner surface of the stomach okay, is okay. formed as clear as you know first time. Um, so yeah, they are pretty cool. Uh, over the counter, uh, the directions will say, don't use them for more than two weeks uh, because we don't want to have a patient sort of say like, oh, I've got heartburn or reflux. I'm just gonna take this proton pump inhibitor. And they might also, be, they might be covering up symptoms of something more serious, like an that, that won't be treated until it gets really bad. So uh, over the counter, use it for a couple of weeks. People can be on it long-term for GERD and other stuff. Um, ideally, patients will be able to make some lifestyle adjustments to offset the GERD. I, I had GERD for a little while. I, got, I actually freaked. Oops, I don't know what I did. I zoomed in somehow. Uh, um, oh, there we go. Uh, I, I thought I, would 
I, I was getting like a, a lump in the, in my throat when I was swallowing and I freaked out because my mom had just been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. I'm like, oh my God, I've got thyroid cancer too. And, and I went in, they're like, you have GERD. And I was like, oh, okay. And they're like, you need to stop eating chocolate, drinking alcohol and coffee. And, and I'm like, okay, so what am I going to eat and drink? And <laughs> so I'm like, give me medicine. So I did medicine uh, for a while, but then there was, you know, with, with, with anything, it's, it sounds too good to be true. It, it might be. So uh, there were some studies out of like Europe that really long-term use of proton pump inhibitors could cause some issues down the line potentially. So I finally cut down on spicy food and alcohol somewhat and other stuff. And it's, um, oh my gosh, Callie says a, a friend got uh, GERD and ended up being stage three esophageal cancer. Yeah, so there, it's definitely stuff that you want to get checked out. Um, fortunately, it's fairly easy to take a look uh, at, at the esophagus and kind of see what's going on. It's not the most pleasant procedure, but you can just do it outpatient. I, I shoved a camera up my nose and down my throat, and that was that. So, uh, but it's definitely worth getting checked out because you never know. It could be something very serious, as, as Callie pointed out. Uh, so for, for you all, uh, determinations or considerations as far as GERD, um, again, sup, semi-supine chair position is going to be the go-to for pretty much all GI stuff. You'll see it appear on every, <laughs> every disease state we talk about today, uh, which makes sense, though, because if someone's getting reflux, if they're laying flat, it's a lot easier for those stomach contents to make their way up into the esophagus. So by raising the chair head, um, you've got gravity helping you out instead. Um, if you notice any, any, any major issues in, in the, uh, as far as erosion or caries, um, that is, a, again, a potential complication of uncontrolled GERD, which is really, really not good. So they need to be getting seen um, by a doctor ASAP to get, um, to get medication for that and treatment for that. Because uh, if it's gotten to the point where it's, it's eroding their tooth enamel, um, it's really not controlled and not great. So. Uh, let's see, question, oh, we actually, we have a quick mini case and then we'll do questions. So we're, you've just reviewed chart for a new patient, 55 year old, 5'6 guy, 205 pounds. He's visiting today to get a cleaning. This chart lists the following meds. Um, normally I would have you talk with a neighbor, but we're all online. So we're not gonna mess with breakout rooms. Just go ahead and throw some questions in the chat. Just kind of, you can think about it for a second um, or you can unmute and, and, and say what you're thinking. but. Uh, just come up with a couple of questions you might want to ask this patient about their meds and, and medical history. And if you have any other questions that we haven't covered yet, feel free to check, type them now as well. Why, uh, what do you take the Tums for and how often are you having to take them, says Miranda. Ask if he's experiencing xerostomia. I would ask what the reason for taking the Tums, how long been taking omeprazole, check the BP, he's on a blood pressure med. Good call, Megan. Yeah, these are all good questions, kind of things to, uh, to be considering. Uh, you know, first up, uh, up is lisinopril, that is a blood pressure medication, an ACE inhibitor. Um, and so, you know, seeing if his blood pressure is decently controlled, could be a nice check-in. If he's not going in to get his blood pressure checked very often, you've got a captive audience in the chair there. That, uh, that's one of the cool things about uh, uh, dentistry is that you've got, you guys, they're, they're not going anywhere. And so where, whereas in the pharmacy, if, if they can run away from us, but you guys, you guys uh, have them there, you can chat with them, um, ask them questions and, and take blood pressure. So that's a great one. Omeprazole, of course, is one of those proton pump inhibitors we were just talking about. So um, and Tums kind of goes along with that as an antacid. So maybe asking, you know, how often they're having to take the Tums and uh, uh, get a sense of how controlled their GERD might be, assuming it's GERD, uh, you can double check that. So yeah, those are all good questions. Has a doctor ever diagnosed you with GERD or do you experience a lot of acid reflux? Do you know if it's caused by food or stress? Exactly, so kind of getting a little more information. Um, if it's well controlled, they may be fine laying totally flat. If it's not so well controlled, they might appreciate raising the head of the chair a little bit. Um, can can the high blood pressure be um, associated with the GERD? Like, could GERD uh, or like acid reflux or something cause your body to have higher blood pressure? You know, in a roundabout way, I think it could. It's not. It's not. They don't usually go hand in hand as far as. Um, I don't know, diagnostic criteria or anything of that nature, but uh, I don't know so much about blood, high blood pressure causing 
GERD, um, but I could see GERD stressing you out and you're in your in pain. You tend to get your, your blood pressure tends to go up when you're uncomfortable and you're stressed and, and not feeling good. So I can see it kind of working the other way, but maybe not so much uh, blood pressure causing the GERD, but that was a good question, good consideration. What other questions do you all have at this point? before we change gears and start talking about the other end of our human tubular body. Oops, didn't mean to hit that button yet, sorry. All right, if you have any other questions, just feel free to pop them in the chat. All right, so our next topic, constipation. So lots of things can go wrong uh, with, with the intestines and cause constipation. Uh, functional abnormalities, which are literally like essentially uh, st structural defects in the in the intestines that are you know not present in a normal healthy intestine. Lots of different diseases, um, IBS, IBD. Um, uh, you know, you can have a short-term thing like a norovirus or something like that. Well, maybe actually norovirus is more diarrhea. Um, you can have rectal problems, so issues with the anus itself that can cause uh, hesitancy to use the bathroom. And then as a result, you start having problems with constipation because uh, just as a reminder, so the colon, which on this picture is the big, uh, big green tube. Anybody remember what the main function of the colon is? So the small intestine, the really long skinny orange tube, that primarily absorbs nutrients from your food. So that's what its main thing is. It's getting all the vitamins, nutrients, and good stuff out of there. Uh, the colon, it is compacting the waste uh, through water absorption, exactly. Uh, the, GI, the team GI is coming through again. Uh, exactly. So, so it, the colon, its main function is to absorb water, which compacts the stool, because when it's in the in the small intestine, it's everything's in a slurry. is very is very liquidy uh, to aid the absorption of nutrients and get all the good stuff you can out of there. Uh, as you get to the colon, it's it's trying to keep us from getting dehydrated, so it, it sucks all the water that it can out of it. Um, and so, you know, if you're staying decently hydrated, that's one of the ways the body stays hydrated, basically. So if you're dehydrated, not drinking enough water, your body's going to pull more water out of your stool, and you'll become constipated. Um, Anyhow, so things that mess with uh, that mess with the amount of time that stool stays in the colon can cause constipation. So if someone has a rectal problem, like say they've got an anal fissure or hemorrhoid or something like that, um, and it hurts to go to the bathroom, they may be hesitant to use the bathroom. And by being hesitant, they might put it off going to the bathroom, which then gives the stool more time to dry, more time to get more hard, and more time to get more compacted is more food kind of blocks it up and comes through the, you know, and it causes basically a traffic jam. Um, you can also get, uh, there's neurological diseases that the, what's interesting is the colon uh, and the intestines have basically as many nerve endings and neurons in them as your brain does. And actually maybe more if you add up small intestine and large intestine. So like the, the, the there are billions of neurons in the intestine, which is really weird to think about. Uh, and maybe where the term gut feeling comes from, like trust your gut, like there might be something to the gut brain. I don't know, people talk about that. That's it's an area of current research, but um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I agree, Kelly. It's much better to be at the start of the tube than the end. Um, so a lot of neurologic things that can, that can affect it. So stress, when you're stressed out, your colon tends to slow down, the nerves are getting worked over and all this. And then not to mention all the multitude of drugs that can mess with stuff. Lots of different things can go wrong. So your symptoms, excessively dry, infrequent, or insufficiently sized stool. Uh, and you can't, and, you, and after you go to the bathroom, you feel like you still have to go. So um, there are different, there are actual categories, that, like medical categorizations for types of stool and how liquidy or fluffy or whatever it is. Um, we're not, we're not going to go into that, but just uh, if it's hard and, it, and it's painful, uh, you're probably dealing with constipation. If it gets really bad, again, our complications are going to be bowel impaction, or even which is usually requires some kind of assistance to clear the impaction, uh, whether that's digital, i.e., someone 
digging around in there with tools, fingers, whatever else, um, or uh, an obstruction which could require surgery to take care of. So we, those are things we want to really avoid um, by using some of the products that we're going to be talking about coming up. Uh, let's see. So we have a whole bunch of things to help with conscious patients. Bulk forming agents are the most uh, uh, kind of the, the, the ones that have been around the longest. This is literally just fi fiber supplements. So it's an ins, and we'll talk more about them in a little bit. Emollients are also called stool softeners. These are essentially soaps that work to like uh, emulsify fats in the stool and keep the stool more moist. You've got saline osmotics. These ones are kind of the big guns as far as over the counter um, or even prescription uh, type of, um, of constipation meds are. So they, these get things moving real fast. Uh, lubricants are what they sound like. It's literally insoluble oil that is comes out of the ground and someone drinks it and it lubes the stool. Hyperosmotics uh, are, are pretty darn effective. Um, they take a little bit to, to kick in and start working in some cases. Uh, but they basically draw liquid towards them into the stool and, and move things along. Combo products are mixtures of things like stimulants and emollients that, uh, that kind of work together, uh, getting the best of both worlds for the two types of products. So I will, we'll kind of talk about each of these in turn. And then I see, um, yeah, exactly. Megan mentions uh, people using stool softeners after, after, uh, having children because they don't want to have to deal with bearing down anymore. They've done enough of that for quite some time. Um, so let's talk first about the bulk forming agents. So these, these are literally plant fibers. So the, the common ingredient is psyllium husk. Psyllium is a type of, of seed or grain. And they take the, uh, you can kind of see just real little here, Metamucil has this picture of like a grassy grainy thing on it. And and that is the psyllium grain. And they take, they take that, the husk of that, and it's an insoluble fiber, meaning it doesn't dissolve and it doesn't get absorbed by, uh, into the body. So it's when you eat it, it stays in your intestine. But it, being that it's a, it's a fiber, it draws water towards it and it adds bulk to the stool. So it keeps the stool from getting as compacted in the colon. And um, oh yeah, yes, as Caitlin points out, you cannot push after a C-section. So you need a smooth move with every time. Exactly right. Um, and so with the, with the fiber, it's basically, it's keeping things bulked up, keeping things more moisturized and helps it move along. Side effects though, is the natural gut bacteria really love eating this plant matter. And so they end up, it ends up causing gas and cramping. And if you, if you don't mix it with enough water or I don't know, taking too much of it, you can actually block your esophagus if you go overboard with the stuff. So you got to make sure to stay good and hydrated and wash it down well. Uh, but it, these are these are nice, gentle, um, you know, no real side effects to, uh, with medications or anything to speak of. Um, and anyway, easy, easy and they're cheap. Next up are our friends, the stool softeners. So they are, it's literally a soap uh, or a surfactant that kind of mixes with fats and softens the stools. You can get sometimes diarrhea if you go overboard on them, maybe some mild cramping, but they're, but they're really mild. These ones you all will, will likely see, or you, you might be recommending even if anybody is in getting dental work done and they get a narcotic pain medication. So the narcotics, uh, all the opioids, they work directly on the colon and slow down uh, the movement of food through the colon. So there's, there's something called peristalsis, which is like this, this slow rhythmic uh, constriction that runs the length of the colon. So it starts at one end and all the muscles kind of in a, in a, in a line just squeeze. So imagine, I don't know, taking like a long rubber tube and squeezing it and pulling your hand across it to squeeze stuff out of it or like, a, like a, oh, toothpaste tube, there you go. Squeezing, it's like squeezing a toothpaste tube. It's like that, that contraction that runs the length of the tube. That's what your colon does to move in, uh, your stool along, but opioids really slow that down, the, both the frequency and the strength of the contractions. And so you get the stool sitting in the, in, in the colon longer, you get constipation, it gets too dried out. So it's, it's a really good idea anytime that, just like after a C-section, if somebody's taking a narcotic, they should be taking a stool softener and starting it at the same time just to prevent constipation because it's gonna happen uh, if you're on this, if you take more than you know a day or two's worth of uh, 
uh, narcotic, maybe even a day's worth. Uh, so that is your stool softeners. They're not super potent, but they, they, can, they can help in a preventative sense pretty well. Here are the big guns, saline osmotics. Magnesium citrate is the most potent over-the-counter um, uh, laxative that you can get. Uh, you can also get some other ones, that, but uh, different flavors and stuff. But mag citrate, you can always tell what it is because it's always in a glass bottle. And it's either a clear glass bottle or a green glass bottle. And there's really two flavors. There's like cherry or lemon lime. And that's about it. And to, drink, to use it, you chug half the bottle and then you stay near a toilet because it usually kicks in within about a half hour to an hour at most. If half the bottle doesn't do it, you chug the other half and you should be moving soon. Um, if someone chugs a whole bottle and they're not moving, it's probably time to talk to the doctor because this stuff is a very powerful, potent um, osmotic, basically kind of like the fiber. It's, it's not absorbed by your body. It stays in the intestine, but it's super powerful at drawing liquid to it. Uh, so it creates this really strong osmotic gradient to suck liquid out of the surrounding tissues of the intestine and colon and such and move it along. So you get this basically a, a mini flood going through you. It moves things along. So if someone hasn't gone to the bathroom for a few days and really needs to go, this is usually the go-to to get them moving again and then maybe something like a stool softener to keep them from getting blocked up again or something. Uh, side effect wise, nausea, vomiting, cramps, diuresis uh, and dehydration. So you can actually overdo it and dehydrate yourself with this stuff if you take it too much. So you gotta be careful. Uh, questions so far, I've gone through kind of three of our roughly six types of laxatives. And so I just want to make sure we, um, nobody has any questions. All right, move right along then. So uh, other types, we've got uh, hyperosmotics, a couple of main different forms. One is polyethylene glycol, which is what's in Miralax. And these are fairly potent, but, but relatively gentle. I mean, they're, they're effective. Uh, they do take a couple of days, two, two to sometimes three days to really get working. But once they're working, they do the job well. Works the same way as the, as the, um, the hyperosmotics that we were just talking about, or the, the uh, just previously, the, the mag citrate and things like that. But they're, they're not quite as fast acting. Um, uh, glycerin is primarily used for kids, but it can be used in adults too. And it's usually in the form of suppositories. So you've got like little babies or little kids that aren't great at taking medicine. Um, and the suppository is usually the way to go. Uh, they cause irritation to the tissue in the colon. And so it causes secretions that help lubricate things. Um, and it also draws liquid into it. it kind of cause some rectal irritation, but otherwise very safe, which is why we use it in babies. If you got little kids, um, you know, it's something like uh, the labeling on this will tell you nobody 12 and under, but you can talk to your doctor and, and they can okay it or a you know, pharmacist or something. A lot of times kids are using that just fine on, on short, shorter term basis. Um, there, is, there were some weird reports of like in certain kids, it can make them sort of wild and crazy for a little while after they take it, which is really weird. Uh, I haven't noticed it in my kids when I've used it, but I've read a few reports of it. But Anyway, uh, next up this is actually our last uh, class of medications are the stimulants. So these ones, uh, this is things like Bisacodyl. Um, you'll see it as Senecod as a, as a brand name. It is a stimulant. So it's increasing that muscle contraction of the colon. So it's increasing the strength and frequency of the contractions that move food through the colon. So it speeds things along so the food doesn't have time to dry out uh, in the colon and get so hard. Or if you're already stopped up, it can help move along the stopped up stuff uh, and get it out of there so that you can get back to normal. Uh, you can have issues with cramping because it is such a strong contraction. Uh, it can move things through so quickly that you, that you don't get good electrolyte absorption um, and can throw things off and even nutrient malabsorption. Some folks, uh, patients will use the use stimulants as like a, like a weight loss thing. So they uh, and they kind of abuse stimulants, uh, so the moving the food through quickly, so essentially giving themselves diarrhea so they don't gain weight, and that can be very dangerous because of the electrolyte imbalances and has have heart issues and, and other stuff, and, and also the nutrient malabsorption is not healthy over the long run. 
Uh, oh, there is one more. Sorry, this one. I, I never recommend it, and no one should ever be using it. Even, but it's still on the market, so I need to talk about it. Is mineral oil? You mainly see like really old patients using it because they're like it's what their dad used or whatever. Um, it's it, it is what it sounds. It's it's a mineral based oil, meaning oil from the ground, a non organic oil like motor oil, essentially. It's a refined, clean, cleaner version, I guess. But you're drinking oil that uh, that lubes up the poop, and that's all it does. Um, the problem with it is you're drinking oil. So you can get uh, what's called a foreign body reaction because your body's like, why are you drinking oil? Now I'm giving, you know, I'm gonna like freak out and you're gonna get really sick. You can also accidentally, if you accidentally inhale it, it can screw up the surfactant lining of your lungs and then you can start to have breathing issues. Um, it causes anal itching because it's irritating tissues uh, at both ends. Um, and it can screw up the vitamin absorption. Anybody remember which vitamins are absorbed uh, which are fat soluble vitamins. We've got like, yep, D is one. There's a, there's a, there's three more uh, that are that are fat soluble vitamins that they will stay in the mineral oil and not get absorbed very well. Yeah, exactly. ADEC is the kind of the acronym I remembered for. So vitamins A, D, E, and K are all fat soluble. So if someone's taken mineral oil well, around the time they're eating the vitamins. We'll just stay in the oil and they won't be absorbed. Um, uh, last but not least is a combo of a couple of things we just talked about. So our emollients or stool softeners mixed with a stimulant is a pretty potent combination. In pharmacy, we call this the mush and the push. So the uh, stool softener mushes things up, the stimulant pushes things along, and uh, you got this nice one-two punch that, that clears people out. Uh, unfortunately, you get side effects from both, but either they tend to not be too bad. As far as dental hygiene is concerned, um, you know, you guys should be prescribed, if, if a dentist isn't prescribing uh, or recommending a stool softener or something with a narcotic, uh, maybe give them a quick reminder like, hey, remember this weird dude told me that like stool softeners are a great thing to give a narcotic so you don't get constipated or I don't know, maybe you, maybe you just like whisper it to the patient as their way out the door or something like that. Um, if, you know, again, maybe maybe different pair, chair position. Again, our semi-supine chair is back. Uh, questions about diarrhea before we hit our last topic, or I'm sorry, questions about constipation before we hit our last topic, diarrhea. If somebody is experiencing like chronic constipation, could that somehow affect them I like feeling like they have fe feelings of some kind of like more heartburn or does the lower affect the upper at all or are they um hmm gen i mean generally not like if they're backed up and they can't and then they're like things are just not moving does does that affect well any okay actually here here is this um the if you are if you're really backed up in the colon your body is going to like not feel great. You're probably not going to want to eat because your body's going to know like adding more food to this is just going to make it worse. <laughs> and so, so that could, as far as causing GERD or reflux, I don't. Yeah. So not chronically or long-term. Yeah. They're, they're, they're too far apart. You yeah. got, you got six feet of colon and 33 feet of small intestine plus the stomach and the esophagus. So you got a lot of room Things would have to get really backed up before it, it, you, you'd be having lots of other problems before it got that bad, thankfully. Uh, but the, that kind of the stress and some of those other things that we that 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 can be a result of the chronic constipation can definitely predispose you to issues like GERD and some of these other things. So it can kind of be a snowball effect in that regard. And then, zero, um, oh, sorry. Go no, yeah, go ahead. And then like dry mouth or xerostomia with any of those, like if somebody happens to take one of those things that take out the water a lot, can that, is mm -hmm. that something that you can see? Um, if, if you're getting real dehydrated, then yeah, they would, they would notice it and decrease saliva production potentially, but you'd be having other issues too, like decreased urination and, mm. you know, it would be, you would feel thirsty, really thirsty before it got too bad before you got. So too usually bad. we wouldn't see patients that would have like chronic dry mouth from no, this probably not from no not from that i mean if they did they'd have to be chronically dehydrated they probably yeah. have other things going on too but yeah it, it wouldn't it wouldn't 
directly cause uh, dry mouth before other other drying issues. Uh, good question. Other questions? I see that uh, Avalon's wondering, yes, caffeine is indeed a stimulant uh, that helps with the peristalsis and uh, gets things moving. So um, that is exactly true. And then uh, you'll have a hard time moving and get some smooth move at the store. <laughs> That's right. Uh, what was the question, uh, Brianna, about gastroparesis? Um, so I was just going off of Leslie's thing with gastroparesis because I have gastroparesis. And so that's like the partial paralysis of my stomach and my intestinal yeah. tract. And so like that can cause chronic constipation. And because like things can't move down, that gave me GERD. So things moved up and then that comes into like play in my oral cavity. So I'm guessing, like, I'm wondering if there, like, if it, things down below can affect things up above with certain like disorders. Yeah, they definitely can with certain, with, with disorders like that. You're exactly right. So that would be, a, that would be a good example of that. I mean, uh, I was kind of thinking with the original question about someone that gets constipated for whatever reason, you know, does that kind of immediately lead to GERD and other issues, but you're exactly right. When your stomach isn't passing food down, it can only go one way, which is back up, gives you the reflux and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, you you probably got experience with some of these products and I would assume. So if you have any any good tips from a patient perspective and you're willing to share them, I'd appreciate it. But no, no pressure either way. They're just, when you're talking about mag citrate, I wanted to throw up. It's just a lot of these products are really terrible. And when patients <laughs> take them, it's a really terrible experience. So yeah. just be nice to them. Yeah, no, and it, that is true. I've uh, lucky, lucky me. I got the uh, experience, even though I'm just hit uh, forty recently. I got, I got a good uh, uh, one of those colon viewing sessions or whatever, where they probed me and stuff. And taking that day of, uh, it's, I, it was basically a lot of Miralax and and like mag citrate type stuff, and it's, it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason they put these flavor packets in and there's a reason they tell you to get it nice and cold uh, and even drink it with a straw because it's they're kind of salty and they're they're just yeah they're not they're not great but they do work um i, I will give them that but it is to, to your point it is not a pleasant experience um any other questions about constipation before we move on we've got we're getting close to the end of time here, so I'm going to move fast in this last set of slides, but I like these questions. If you have any, throw them in the chat and I'll read, I'll read away. So diarrhea, just like constipation, lots of different things that can cause the diarrhea. Drugs, toxins, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Four o'clock. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Try, figuring out who's going to pick up the dog from the groomer. We have, a, we have one of these dogs that has hair instead of fur, so they like have to get her cut because it just gets longer and longer and crazier and crazier. Anyway, um, so lots of things can, can go wrong to cause diarrhea, just like constipation. Chronic diarrhea can, uh, can be the laxative abuse or misuse, which she talked about in issues with lactose intolerance, IBS, IBD, malabsorption, so all kinds of stuff basically causing it. Not a lot of options for the diarrhea meds that you'll commonly see, um, which in a sense is nice. There are a lot of very specific products for certain things like irritable bowel and, and other things like that, but um, uh, they're, they're not nearly as common as, as, um, as some of the stuff here. So we're just gonna, for, uh, in the interest of time today, we're gonna be only focusing on Lamotol, which is a prescription product, Imodium, which you can get over the counter and good old Pepto, which we've already talked briefly about. Uh, Lamotil is basically, um, we talked about how opioids uh, slow down the intestinal tract of, of, through decreasing that peristalsis, that rhythmic contraction of muscles. Lamotil, which is a mixture of diphenoxalate and atropine, the, the diphenoxalate binds to the same receptors that an opioid would, so that a narcotic would, but it binds uh, it binds to the receptors that are most directly affecting intestinal motility or in, uh, that peristalsis. And they're 50 times more potent at slowing down the intestines than an opioid is. So this is like 
but really big guns. It brings everything to a grinding halt in the colon. So the colon can just sit there and leisurely absorb liquid from the intestines. Uh, it is really slowing things down. Um, any ideas? Oh, I guess it says it on there. I was gonna ask why the atropine's in there. So atropine is an anticholinergic, like we talked about um, earlier. And it is included in this to a, a discourage overdose because since this is an op since diphenoxalate is an opioid receptor agonist or it, it, you know it turns on these these things you can get some uh, some of the kind of the more nice effects of feeling kind of high or whatever if you took a lot of it uh, similar to what you get for taking a lot of an opioid but to discourage that they put in the atropine which makes the patients not see, not spit, not pee, not shit. And all of those things are very unpleasant and discourages overdose of it. As you can see, there are a whole bunch of side effects with this medication, which is why it's a prescription product uh, to be kind of uh, help manage those and prepare patients for those. Uh, highlighted gingival hyperplasia, not because it's really common, but because it's dental related. And I was all excited to see one that was specifically dental related. Um, but the you know, lots of different things can go on with this one. Um, the Imodium, on the other hand, uh, is an over-the-counter product. It is also an opioid antagonist, or agonist rather, uh, and is both slowing down the gut and also decreasing uh, secretions. It's not nearly as potent as the uh, Lamotil that we just saw, which is why you can get over-the-counter, but it is still quite effective. Um, you can get some dry mouth with this one fairly commonly, so that's something that you might uh, hear patients complain about, but in addition to some of the other issues that are up here. Uh, let's see. Last but not least, our Pepto, which is decreasing secretions and, and things like that. So it, it, you know, it can also be used to kind of help relieve kind of mild uh, diarrhea and things of that nature. So hopefully if someone's got diarrhea, they're not coming in to the dentist's office to get a cleaning or anything. Um, but I guess if they do, maybe you guys come up with some kind of safe word or something or uh, frantic pat on the shoulder to say it's time to run to the restroom or something. Um, but that's about it. Questions so far. And oh, look at that, still got two minutes left. It's not my kid, it's just some other cute kid. I should put my kids in here, but this kid made me laugh. Um, I guess questions before we do our mini case, our last mini case. <laughs> yeah, well, it makes me wonder why doctors go through medical school to do that. Exactly, it's for the big bucks, I guess. All right, well, if you have questions, throw it in the, in the chat or any comments. Uh, this last mini case, uh, another patient, 36 year old, uh, taking Lipitor, Pepto, APAP. Any questions for him? And you can throw those in the chat too. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. Nobody has questions? I'd ask him about the Pepto. Oh, taking APAP, which uh, would cause constipation, correct? Is he taking a stool softener? Um, so it, APAP potentially can cause constipation. It's one, of the, it's one of the laundry list of side effects that come up. It's not a super common side effect with APAP, to be honest. APAP is usually pretty darn mild in, the, in terms of pain relievers. Um, uh, but it is it is a potential. Um, why are you taking the Pepto? Yeah. So as you, as as the the little uh, ad here showed us with the Pepto, there's you know it could be indigestion, could be nausea, could be diarrhea. There's lots of could just be that they really like the taste of Pepto. Uh, Pepto uses a wintergreen flavoring. If, if I don't know if, if anybody found there used to be these candies that are a little pink. Uh, circular candies that you could eat and they tasted just like Pepto-Bismol. I made a comment about those last year uh, in this class and then the uh, someone sent me a bag of them as like uh, that they must have found online. It came in this like kind of bulk bag with just a generic label on it or something and I hadn't seen those candies in years. Anyway, 
they're delicious. I left them in my office during COVID and went and found them a couple of weeks ago. And I'm, I'm like, oh, they're still good. So delicious. And I managed to eat them all now. Uh, black tongue, black stool. That could be a good thing to kind of remind them that can happen with the Pepto and ask if they've experienced it. Um, and ask how it's working for them. Are they taking it often? Exactly. What's the Lipitor for? Have you guys covered that one yet? It's not blood pressure, but you're, in, you're thinking along the right lines. It is, yes, cardiovascular, it's cholesterol. Um, exactly, so that's gonna lower, uh, lower cholesterol production in the body. Your body makes its own cholesterol internally because uh, the cholesterol molecule is used in a lot of hormones and things like that. And so if you're getting plenty of cholesterol in your diet, your body doesn't have to make so much. So using something like Lipitor will shut down the body's internal production of cholesterol, uh, if you're like me and love cheese. Uh, all right, that pretty much does it. The take points are, if anybody, if you see GI meds, ask them about chair position. They may, they may be more comfortable with semi-supine chair position. If you're in doubt, look it up or ask somebody. Um, the uh, I didn't talk too much about this before in the examples, but uh, you know, if someone asks you a question or you're unsure about something, uh, if you've got a moment to, to check a reference, whether it's a drug reference or uh, phoning a friend, whatever the case may be, uh, just look it up. Um, it just takes a second. And again, you guys have captive audiences. They're not going anywhere. So if you need a minute to double check something, it's not going to probably throw things off too bad. So that does it for uh, this presentation. So thank you so much, Dr. Fortner. We really appreciate yeah. it. That was great. Thank you all for the questions and participation. Again, sorry I couldn't see in person, but maybe. We enjoyed the moments of levity. That was great. <laughs> yes, the candy. Yes. Uh, Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Enjoy your dog. Oh yeah, definitely. She she probably has another hour before I get to go pick her up. So um, I'm happy to hang around. If uh, I don't know if you guys have time for more questions or anything. Oh, I, I like think they have a break and then they have another class. Okay, very good. Is that a Twizzler yeah. Janice? That I, uh, is <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah. Twizzler Janice with a mustache. Yeah, exactly. I love it. All right. Uh, well, thank you all. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to. You can email me. It's just Jay Fortner at civicu.edu. Otherwise, stay safe out there. Thank you so much. Have, Have a good, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Leslie. That was fun. Oh, good. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. We'll probably be in touch next semester. If you need any dental hygiene, anything, let me know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sounds like a plan.